Okay, so I want to go back and explain something which I didn't do too well the first time. So this might be appearing in the middle of another video, but we'll see. So basically, so we've realised now this Lorentz factor that we first of all defined when we defined the fall velocity as simply being the time component of the fall velocity that measures how this coordinate time changes with respect to proper time. And now by considering the normalisation of fall velocity, we were able to arrive at the following expression for the Lorentz factor, where this v is of course the coordinate velocity in some particular frame. So now I want to show you quite a nice way that we can think about this expression. We're going to also revisit this idea of proper time that we've introduced. So another way we can view this expression now is, instead of this kind of derivative, we can instead rewrite it to look a bit more like a differential equation. Simply just rearranged and kind of split this differential into a more usual differential equation form. And so now this is another way which we can interpret this gamma expression is that it's, well, from this expression we can see it's kind of giving the increment, incremental ratio of how much proper time, uh, how much coordinate time changes with respect to each proper time increment. And now we can clearly see from this expression d tau is going to be some factor times the amount dt and we have briefly seeing the form that this Lorentz factor just is going to take as a function. We know that v, when it's much, much less than c, this 1 minus is just going to essentially become 1, and so d tau is really the same thing as dt. But as this velocity becomes much, much larger and approaches c, we can see here that this d tau, the, the, d, the dt interval is going to have to become much, much larger, because this square root is going to be coming much, much smaller than 1. And so to keep this interval d tau constant, this dt needs to increase massively to compensate. So we've seen how we can play around with these intervals in some other videos, and we've seen the, how they're related. But now let's just consider this expression. And we can now treat this as a differential equation for the proper time. And so we can simply start solving the equation by integrating. So we can integrate with respect to the proper time. I'm going to leave the limits off. They're just going to be fixing the absolute value, but we can just consider it indefinitely for now. And then we're going to integrate this thing with respect to dt. And now, however you would do this integral, maybe just simply numerically, you could integrate between two arbitrary times. And that's just going to give you the solution for the proper time interval between those two coordinate time intervals. But now we can actually work a bit more with this expression. We can realize that it's actually talking about something quite fundamental. So if I now just start doing some manipulations to this expression that might start feeling a bit uncomfortable to you, but just Bear with it for the moment, and you'll see where it's leading to eventually. So first of all, what we're going to do is bring this dt inside of the square root, where it's going to become a, a dt squared. So we're going to have, just pulling the dt in the root, it gets squared, so we have a dt squared. And now we need to work out what this thing v squared over c squared dt squared is going to be. 
So I'll just do that down here for now. Well, first of all, I can realize I can rewrite V, which is the coordinate velocity, I can rewrite as dx by dt. So I can write this whole thing as 1 over c squared dx by dt squared dt squared. And now just fairly naively, we can just cancel these dt squareds and realize that this thing, v squared dt squared over c squared is just gonna be one over c squared dx squared. And so writing that in over here, we arrive at the following. And now this might already be starting to feel quite familiar. This is now starting to look very similar to our line element. If I now just pull a factor of one over c squared out of this square root, it's going to just become a 1 over c, and then to compensate I need to have it on in the first term again, and then it's gone from the second term. So I've just factorised this 1 over c squared out of the root, and now we can realise that this expression here is our line element, or rather it's the negative of the line element. If you remember, we defined the line element, well, first of all, it's the metric tensor, and in Minkowski space, just working in one plus one dimensions, as I'm doing in this example, it's gonna have the form minus c squared dt squared plus dx squared. And so we can see what we've got in this square root here is just minus ds squared. Okay, so just by, by doing some fairly simple manipulations, just kind of naively multiplying out these differentials, we've now arrived at quite a nice expression, which is essentially now stating that the integral of proper time is somehow just directly related to the integral of our line element. And now this should feel familiar and feel comfortable because as we saw previously, we could realize that this proper time interval is just gonna be directly related to the line element because this proper time is just the length of the line element that is, or the length of the world line in your own frame. And we use that to realize the following relation that this ds squared is always related to the proper time interval in the following way. Remember, we need to have the minus sign there because of our convention. But now we can see that this expression completely agrees with the formulae that we've just derived. Now, don't let the square roots throw you off. What we need to realize is that we can always kind of square and square root these integrals at will to get rid of the square roots because they can be quite annoying at times. But let me just rewrite Removing the intermediate steps now that d tau is equal to this expression. So we found that the integral of d tau is this thing. I'm going to see integral of minus ds squared. And again, I should point out this minus is going to be here because of the convention that we're using. So we just need to be aware that this root is going to be imaginary unless ds squared is negative. And so that feels okay because we know that these negative ds squared lengths corresponded to time-like distances and we like to associate time-like quantities with non-imaginary quantities just because they are corresponding to real particles. And so we can see that if this ds squared is a time-like distance Nothing imaginary is appearing here and everything is real. But that's just a comment, let's just now see what happens. We can just simply square this expression. It's going to be equivalent. So squaring the right hand side, the root goes away, the negative from the inside just comes out and we get a 1 over c squared. But now we can see 
what we've arrived at here is essentially this exact expression here. It's just been integrated. This is just really telling us now that ds squared is minus c squared d tau squared. And we've just integrated that. So now this is quite a fundamental expression. And we should realize that, and so now we've just essentially found a way that we can massage this expression and we've arrived at something which we'd previously derived, which is always nice to show that things are consistent. But now this is actually a, fair, a very, very deep and fundamental expression that really cuts to the core of all of relativity. And when we start doing general relativity, this is going to be our favorite expression of all because it's going to be how we calculate everything, essentially. Because what we're now interested in is this ds squared. And if I just slightly rewrite this expression, the integral of ds squared, or now equivalently, we've seen that it has to be the integral of the square root of minus ds. We can now realize that in general, we can express this as the following. And so this expression now, this square root of our metric tensor is what we're gonna get used to dealing with when we move into general relativity. But this expression now is essentially all it's doing is just calculating the length of a world line. We're just integrating the metric tensor and so this is going to be a fundamental expression that we're going to now keep revisiting because it's good, it is really going to be so powerful for us. In special relativity it has a fairly simple form because these metric components are quite simple. But as we move into general relativity, this is going to become now a general expression where we don't have the Minkowski metric but any space-time metric, g mu nu. And so using an expression like this, we're basically going to be able to calculate the lengths of any world line. And this is a, a good thing to calculate, a good thing, because it's invariant for everyone. And so this is going to be a really powerful expression. And you'll sometimes just see this now kind of shorthand written as just the square root of minus g. And it's going to look a bit weird because there's no dx or no argument for this integral, but we just need to remember this is now talking about the, the metric tensor. Okay, so just to summarize then, we have begun exploring our Lorentz factor in a bit more detail. We've seen how we can massage the expression and arrive at some differential equation that looks like this, which we can then just start to solve by integrating. And then we've seen how we can now massage this expression to arrive at the following form, which is simply given by an integral of the line element. And we're going to now want to keep this expression in the back of our minds because when we move on to general relativity, this is what we're going to be working with in most cases. We're going to be wanting to calculate the lengths of world lines. And the way we know how to do that is using the, the metric tensor. And now, this was meant to be the summary, but I just want to make another quick comment. This expression is incredibly versatile because we can use it essentially in measuring the lengths of any quantities. We can just look at the lengths of world lines, but we can also look at the lengths of vectors. And one really convenient way to calculate the length of a world line is to essentially take the velocity vector at every point on the world line and use that to calculate its length. So what we do when we do that is we are essentially realizing that this thing, this s, or rather the ds, the infinitesimal distance on our world line, we can somehow now write it in terms of this thing, the proper time. Should have had a squared on there. So now I just want to make another really quick comment about this expression. It can be incredibly useful by itself, but now just to show you another useful thing that we can do with this expression. If we realize that this is the integral of negative of, now just in Minkowski space, the Minkowski metric, dx mu 
okay it's new what we can now do and now this is a fairly non-formal way to do this but just to kind of think about this we can if we like re-parameterize re this ds object we can use the proper time to parameterize it if you like we can divide this proper time d tau squared over here divide by this d tau and when it goes into this root it's going to get squared and so it's going to appear on each one of these dx's so effectively what i've done here is i've written that the integral of one kind of naively divided by a d tau this isn't actually how it happens in practice but we can effectively consider it like this and i can then say that this thing is this integral of the eta and then now these are our four velocities i should have had a one over c in here and there should be a minus there and now this is just really another way of stating that the length of this four velocity is normalized because well the integral of one is just one so a c multiplying that c and now what this integral is telling us is the length of our four velocity this ds squared is giving us a length and now i'm kind of parameterizing that length by tau and it's going to tell us how long these vectors are and so this expression is just gonna give us now if i just square things so i can get rid of the square root and not have to worry about it it's going to give us one over c and now a negative of the squared length of this vector and so this is just sorry i should have squared that one over c and now this is just really another way of realizing our statement that the full velocity is normalized because we can just he, see here the integral of 1 is going to be 1 and then if I multiply by a, a minus c squared I get that the squared length of our full velocity is constant and normalized so I'm just throwing this at the end here making you realize that when we have our dx's we can kind of re-parameterize and turn these dx's into dx by d tau's and this allows us to measure other lengths say the lengths of four velocity vectors but the key thing to keep track of and that you should really be taking away from this is this expression which is the integral of our metric or the line element rather and that's essentially how we can fundamentally measure everything within our geometry and when the metric tensor becomes now more non-trivial none of these expressions are going to have to change we're just going to have to substitute in some different metric components and so formulating the theory in terms of a, an expression that looks like this is going to be then incredibly powerful because it will be a general expression that's going to work for any space-time regardless of what these metric components are going to be so when we want to start now writing down a Lagrangian this expression is going to be one of the building blocks that we're going to use to essentially build our Lagrangian out of because first of all ds squared is something that's available for all observers it's an invariant so it's a, a good property to put into a Lagrangian and it's also now quite fundamental and universal for any geometry and so it's going to build quite a very powerful and widely applicable theory which is of course general relativity so just now wanted to start introducing you to this idea of how these kind of lengths of space-time intervals are really powerful and we compute them using these integrals of our metric tensor so this is just now another way that we can arrive at this similar kind of expression and we've come at it from the Lorentz factor approach rather than the four velocity approach.